Anybody else still love dinosaurs? Well, how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible? What happened that changed everything? A three-letter word, sin, changed everything. How do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible? And our answer tends to surprise people. Our answer is, well, how do you do it? You don't. People say, wait, don't you guys believe in them? Absolutely. But here's the thing. We don't try to squeeze things or fit things into God's Word. What we do is we start with the Bible and use it to explain the world around us, including dinosaurs. Because what the Bible does for us is it gives us the big picture of history. It gives us the right understanding of the past that we apply to the evidence in the present. And then we can properly understand dinosaurs and see that real science confirms what the Bible clearly says. This issue of dinosaurs and how old they are and their origin, the age of the earth, guys, ultimately, it's a worldview issue. You see, because all scientists, whether they're secular or biblical, they've got the same stuff in the present. The same rock layers, the same fossils, the same DNA, the same starlight in the present. But here's the key. They interpret those things differently in the present and make different guesses about where those things came from and thus their age based on their different starting assumptions about the past. If you start with the wrong assumptions, you'll most likely get the wrong conclusions. And friends, secular scientists have reached some really wrong conclusions about certain things, like the age of the earth and universe and dinosaurs and so forth. Why? Because they're starting with the wrong assumptions about the unseen past. They're trusting man's word over God's word about history. Did you realize up until about the late 1700s, early 1800s, most scientists believed the Bible? and thought the earth was only thousands of years old. So then what did they discover in the early 1800s for many of them to change their minds, reject the Bible, and instead believe in millions of years? What did they find? The answer is actually nothing, at least nothing tangible. You see what happened is some guys like James Hutton and Charles Lyell and many others, they popped up on the scene and they suggested this. They said, you know what? We don't need Noah's flood to explain all these rock layers and fossils. They said, you know, we can explain all these rock layers and all these fossils with only natural processes. If we give those natural processes enough time. And this is where the idea of millions of years was born. Not based on any new evidence. Same rocks, same fossils, but a different interpretation that starts with the assumption that God's word is wrong about the past and that man's word is a better starting point. Can I show you how millions of kids today, multiple generations, have in a similar way been brainwashed? Give them a book like this that says, I can read about dinosaurs. And what do you think are the first words in the book? Ah, you guys have this book too. That's right. Millions of years ago. Here's another book. First words, millions of years ago. Beloved Dr. Seuss. Not the first words, but millions of years ago. Or you can think about it like this. You can meet little Joey here who's five and about to start school. Public, private, homeschool, Christian, it does not matter. And he already knows about things like evolution. The Big Bang. Ape men. Dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. How? Meet his preschool teachers. Now guys, I think in many cases, we as Christians fail to recognize a very important truth, and that is this. We are not the only fishers of men. And dinosaurs have been one of the main baits that the secularists use, driven by the enemy, whether they recognize it or not, to reel people, especially kids, into a secular evolutionary worldview that basically says the Bible's history is not true and cannot be trusted. If we cannot believe the Bible's history... Why on earth trust what it says about salvation? And that makes sense, right? If you can't believe the beginning of this book, why would you trust the middle or the end? And guys, that's why it is so important that we are indeed obedient to God's word, to give an answer for our faith, where it's being attacked today, defend the faith, and proclaim the gospel effectively. That's why we need answers about dinosaurs. So let's put on those biblical glasses and get some of those answers. According to the Bible, on which day were dinosaurs created? Day six. Very good. How do we know? Well, because we drew two T-Rexes in that picture, and that proves it. Does the Bible explicitly say when God made the T-Rex? It does not. But can we figure it out with some basic logic? Think about it. T-Rex is a land animal. The Bible says land animals were made on day six. Therefore, 
T-Rex was made on day six. And we must admit, and this is important to understand, the Bible is not a science textbook. The Bible doesn't give us all the details for geology and biology and so forth. And some say, okay, but wait, if they were made on day six, then why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? And it's true, we do not find the word dinosaur in the Bible. For the same reason, we don't find words like locomotive, rocket, Facebook, or Twitter. The word dinosaur is a very new word. was not invented until 1841 by a guy named Sir Richard Owen. Basically means terrible lizard. wasn't really used that much until the early 1900s. So, of course, we do not expect to find the word dinosaur in those earlier English translations. The word itself was not even invented yet. But interestingly, there is another word in those older English translations before evolutionary thinking became dominant that in many cases seems to describe known types of dinosaurs. And that word is dragon. Translated from the Hebrew word tanim, repeated numerous times throughout the Old Testament. One example is Psalm 74, 13, thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters, maybe referring to the chronosaurus or something like a plesiosaur. There's also a couple places in the Bible where it appears that even God himself describes a dinosaur. In the book of Job, God told Job to behold a behemoth. And the word behemoth just means a monstrous beast. And God wants Job to look at it. So it's a real creature. And if you remember the context here, uh, God's kind of showing Job his creative power, and putting Job in his place. Job, I know you don't understand, but trust me, I'm God. See my creative power. I love you and I got you covered. Kind of showing Job that through this example. And there are a lot of study Bibles that may suggest to us, you'll find in a many, that behemoth was possibly a hippo or an elephant. But let's see if the description given in Job fits a hippo or an elephant. It goes on saying in verse 16, Behemoth's strength is in his loins and his power is in his belly. And so in other words, behemoth has a big belly. And of course, elephants fit that description. Hippos do as well. I would argue he's got a bigger belly, he wins, but they all have big bellies. All, right? all three of those creatures fit that part of the description. Verse 17, though, is where we draw some lines of distinction because it says this, that behemoth's tail sways like a cedar. What's implied there are the cedars of Lebanon, really big trees. Behemoth's tail sways like a big tree that sways back and forth in the wind. That is what his tail looks like. You ever seen the tail of a hippo or an elephant? Those are not tree-like tails. They'd be twigs, not trees. So take a tree-like tail, put it on a hippo. Does not fit, right? Put it on a sauropod dinosaur, a long-necked dinosaur. It fits the description really, really, really well. Moving on, another creature mentioned in Job called Leviathan. Something may have been the chronosaurus, maybe pleases the sore. We can't be sure about that. But it's just a fascinating creature. Again, it gives a long description in Job. It's a real creature. God wants Job to look at Leviathan and be in awe of his creative power. And it gives you this description that says he's amazingly aggressive and powerful. Uh, don't mess with him. But then it says some pretty amazing stuff about Leviathan. That his sneezing throws out flashes of light. And his breath sets coals ablaze and flames dart from his mouth. But of course people say, but wait a minute. Come on now, Brian. Are you telling me that you guys had answers believe in the possibility of a fire-breathing critter? Well, before you discount that possibility altogether... Take a look at what God did with the tiny bombardier beetle. When threatened, it fires out a burning liquid at a temperature of over 200 degrees Fahrenheit, almost boiling point. It does it by pumping a liquid fuel into a reaction chamber where a catalyst ignites the mixture. The burning chemicals have nowhere to go but out and with a bang. Now, if God can do that with a less than one inch beetle, what could he do with a multi-ton beast like Leviathan? And someone would say, okay, well, that makes sense. But then here's my question. Brian, if dinosaurs lived with man, then what did they eat? A, B, C, or D? What do you think the answer is? Very good. You guys know the answer is A. Genesis 1, 29 and 30. In the perfect creation before man sinned, God told Adam and Eve they were to eat fruit. And then in verse 30, he taught all the animals that with the breath of life in them, they were to eat plants. Originally, everything was vegetarian before man sinned. And that's a weird thought to us today, but it makes really good biblical sense because the Bible is clear. And you see it in Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 15, Revelation, all throughout the Bible, that it was man's sin that brought death and suffering into this world. And this means you cannot eat meat until after man sinned. Because when we eat meat, we're eating an animal that has what? Died. Before his sin, there is no death. Everything has to be vegetarian. So originally, the T-Rex, just like all other things, was vegetarian. They ate things like fruits and vegetables, pineapples and coconuts. But you know what? That's the way it was, and that's not the way it is. 
What happened that changed everything? A three-letter word, sin, changed everything. Exactly. It brought death and suffering and bloodshed into this world. Romans 8 puts it like this, that all creation is groaning in pain because of man's sin. And wants to be fixed back to the way it was before man sinned back to that perfect state. But let me share you something with you that's really important. If we try to squeeze millions of years into God's Word, like so many try today, no matter how you try, if it's the day-age theory, gaps theory, progressive creation, theistic evolution, framework hypothesis, <gasps> cosmic temple, there are many others, they all have one, at least one, fundamental theological flaw. And please understand this. They all put death before sin. Theologically impossible for multiple reasons. Because here's the thing. If you reject the idea that Noah's flood laid down most of the rock layers and fossils, and you instead believe the secular idea that those rock layers and fossils were laid down over millions of years before man ever existed, and thus before sin, in those rock layers supposedly deposited before man and before sin, we find evidence of animals eating each other. But wait, the Bible says originally before sin, everything was vegetarian. We find in that fossil record things like brain tumors, diseases, cancer, arthritis. But wait, the Bible says God looked down on day six before man sinned and called everything very good. Surely he would not call millions of years of death and suffering and bloodshed and cancer very good. If he did, he's not a very good God. And then most important of all, if we try to squeeze millions of years into the Bible, and please watch this, this tends to be a light bulb moment for so many Christians as it was for me. No matter how you try, you put death before sin. And here's the thing. If there's death before sin, then death is not the consequence or the payment for sin. It's just always been around. Part of God's original very good creation. And if death is not the payment for sin, then Jesus' death does not, cannot pay for our sin debt. And we are all still lost in our sins and bound for hell. And we just destroyed the foundation for the gospel, whether we meant to or not. And at best, at best, we've made this unnecessary. And can I just tell you, this is why we care so much. Our ministry is not about winning a debate It's about defending biblical authority and the gospel based in that authority. That's what's under attack. That's what's at stake. That's why this matters so much. But it's not until after man's sin that the diet for dinosaurs would have changed, like it did for many other creatures. Not until after the flood that God told Noah, just as I gave you plants to eat, now you can eat all things. You can eat everything. And it's not until after the flood that God told Noah, I'm going to put the fear and dread of man into all the beasts of the earth. So after the flood, animals will be scared of man. So keep that thought in mind for a little bit later on. And so for many, we get to this point and they say, okay, Brian, I pick up what you're putting down. So uh, God made dinosaurs. Originally, they were very good, but man sinned. Maybe they became a threat at that point. So maybe, what if God just let them all die during the flood? Which is not unreasonable to think, but is that what the Bible says? says? My answer is no. You see, in Genesis 7, 15, it tells us this, that pairs of all creatures with the breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. That would actually include dinosaurs. And some say, wait a minute, dinosaurs on the ark? How could Noah fit them on the ark? Matter of fact, how could Noah fit all of those animals on the ark? So let me answer the bigger question. We'll talk about dinosaurs in the midst of that answer. When someone asks you that question, there are two main questions we should push back with. The first question should be this. How big was the ark? It was over 500 feet long and 85 feet wide and 50 feet tall with three levels. It's a huge ship, a huge vessel. Capacity equal to roughly 500 railroad stock cars. But was it big enough? How many animals did he take? Well, the Bible's clear. He took only land-dwelling, air-breathing animals onto the ark. And then maybe the most important issue of all where so many people missed this is the Bible's clear Noah took two of each kind onto the ark. So what that simply means is this. Noah did not take 400 pairs of dogs with him on the ark. He most likely never saw a chihuahua or a poodle in his life. And some will say, but hey, aren't there just too many variations of dinosaurs? Aren't there hundreds, even thousands of variations of dinosaurs? Well, just like there are many variations of the dog kind, but just the basic kind, the same thing with cats and horses and so forth, you have a similar thing with dinosaurs. There are many variations of the ceratopsia kind, but just the basic kind. There are many variations of the sauropod kind, but just the basic kind. There are around 60 to at most 80 dinosaur kinds. Not that many. Do you realize that the average size of a dinosaur is equal to that of a bison? Like a really big cow. 
and actually some were as small as chickens. But as it turns out, we know that all dinosaurs started off small. You say, how do you know all? Well, because they hatched from eggs. And the biggest an egg can get is about the size of a football. Because the bigger the egg gets, the thicker the shell's got to be to support its own weight. But the shell can't get too thick because then oxygen can't get through to keep the creature alive. So max size for an egg is about that big. That means all of your dinosaurs, whether it's the stegosaurus, the T-Rex, the brachiosaurus, titanosaurus, seismosaurus, whatever, all started off about the size of a football. And it's reasonable to bet that God brought young adults to Noah for many good practical reasons. You bring young adults because they're smaller, especially the bigger animals, things like elephants, giraffes, bison, dinosaur. Bring, small, bring the young adults, they're smaller. And just be sure there's a pink one and a blue one, that's important later. And I bet God's got that figured out too, right? And then how many were there in total? We did a ton of research on this, and we have all this, of course, at the Ark Encounter here at the museum as well. But a max number of kinds that Noah would need to account for all the variation we see today and in the fossil record would be roughly around 1,400 total kinds. And then once they were on the Ark, the Bible tells us this, that on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of heaven were opened, and the rain fell 40 days and 40 nights. But it says the springs of the great deep burst forth, cracking the crust of the earth, moving it catastrophically all over the world, all at the same time, causing earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic activity on a global catastrophic scale that wrecked this world. And because of that event, we would expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Guess what we find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And some would say, okay, well, that all makes sense. But then here's the thing. If if the flood happened around 4,400 years ago and a lot of dinosaurs died during that time, then shouldn't we find some forensic evidence of dinosaurs living not that long ago? And indeed, we do. Oh my goodness, do we. We're finding soft tissue from dinosaurs still intact in dinosaur bones. For example, in this Triceratops bone, we see this same sort. We see this feature. We see it here in this duckbill dinosaur bone. We find this in this T-Rex bone. And we're finding this again and again and again. Now that we know to look for it, we're finding it all over the place. I'll show you a little video clip of a brilliant, nice lady named Dr. Mary Schweitzer. She's the one who found this particular sample. But she's approaching it from an evolutionary perspective. And as she does, I want you to hear her conclusions. And as you hear these conclusions, just keep in mind the power of a worldview, the power of your starting assumptions. When she picked up a small piece to stop the reaction by putting it in water, it stretched and it sproined and it moved all over the place. So we knew we had something pretty unusual. It appears to be soft tissue. When they look at neighboring parts of the bone, they're even more surprised. Out popped the blood vessels, and they were pretty incredible. And I said, I don't believe it. That's not possible. We need to do it again and again. It's one of those just goosebump-inducing scientific moments. That's all I can say. And I, they don't really happen very often. I think the presence of soft tissues and cells indicates there's a process going on that we didn't have a clue about. So I think it means that we have to kind of rethink the whole chemical process of making a bone turn into a fossil. Don't rethink the age. You can't touch that. Notice what she is basically saying. There must be some chemical process that we have never, ever observed that is somehow making these things last for millions of years. And some will say, well, okay, well, that makes sense. But then if there were dinosaurs on the ark during the flood and they got off the ark and they lived with men after the flood, then shouldn't we find some written historical documentation of that? Surely people would write about that. And indeed, they would and they did. And we have a lot of accounts of this. But remember, the word dinosaur is a brand new word. Not invented until 1841, but before then they were called something else. And we find this name in pretty much every single culture all around the world. What were they called? Dragons. And we find these legends, they're legion. They are all over the place in pretty much every single culture. Now, some are embellished, of course, but many of them describe known types of dinosaurs. And even the honest evolutionist knows about these. Uh, St. George is said to have killed a dragon around 275 A.D., and the description of the dragon that he killed fits out of a dinosaur known as Baryonyx. And in that very same region, we do find bones of Baryonyx. A city in France renamed in honor of the dragon that was killed there, described as bigger than an ox with long, sharp pointed horns on its head. Maybe a triceratops of some sort. Uh, Marco Polo, the man, not the game, 
reported in 1271 AD that the emperor in China used dragons to pull his chariots in his parades. You also find carvings and drawings all over the world that appears to show man with dinosaurs. A few examples of those. Here's a piece of ancient Egyptian pottery. seems to show two long-necked dinosaurs. A Roman mosaic from the second century. Again, two long-necked dinosaurs. I'll go over to northern England, visit Carlisle Cathedral, see the tomb of Bishop Bell, who died around 1500. And there are brass strips around his tomb with carvings of animals on those strips. And some of those carvings look like known types of dinosaurs. Or go to Cambodia, visit this temple built around a thousand years ago. Zoom in on the column of this temple. You have what appears to be a clear depiction of a stegosaurus, the dinosaur with the plates on the back. And then we end up with this question. People say, okay, well, that makes sense. But then here it is, the big one, the one everybody wants to know the answer to. Well, then what happened to them? I'm going to tell you, but hold on. This is where it gets really technical. You ready? This is what happened to the dinosaurs. Now, the question, of course, is why? And we'll get to that here in a second from a biblical perspective. But before we do, let's look at the evolutionary guesses because there are a bunch of them. We see them in the textbooks, very popular today, as I mentioned earlier, that many people suggest some dinosaurs evolved into birds, which we don't have time to elaborate now, but this is biologically, genetically impossible because natural selection and mutations shuffle existing genetic information. They don't add it over time. And you have to add new information to change a dinosaur to a bird. This is genetically impossible. Of course, very popular today is the suggestion that some meteorite or asteroid hit the Earth and killed all of the dinosaurs, big and small, but somehow left everything else alive. I'm sure dinosaurs had many problems after the flood, but we'll make a good a biblical educated guess as to two primary problems they possibly faced after the flood. First will be this. Most likely they're going to have to deal with climate change after the flood. You see, in Genesis 13, God told Noah that the purpose of the flood was to, yes, destroy the people, but also to destroy the earth. Part of the purpose of the flood was to wreck this world that most likely now we live in a junkyard compared to what it used to be before the flood. Now, if you look, before the flood, people on average lived to be over 900 years of age. But then after the flood, then here's your flood line. After the flood, it's just 400 years, then just 200 years, then just 100 years of age. They're not living near as long. So most likely that's one of their bigger problems. But then their second problem will probably be bigger than the first, and that's going to be this people will be hunting them after the flood. Say, people hunt dinosaurs? Yeah. Remember earlier that God told Noah, after the flood, I'm putting the fear of man into all the beasts of the earth, which typically if something is scared of you, either they run from you or they attack you. And of course, the bigger the animal, the bigger the threat. Say after the flood, you know, you have your people together, about 100 years later, you have the Tower of Babel. And you get new languages and you're split up all around the earth. And you and your people start to move to a new region. And you run into a wild herd of chihuahuas. Maybe you love it, maybe you hate it, but you're going to live. But let's say you move to another region. And over here in this region, you guys run into some lions or tigers or bears. What are you going to do, guys? I'm going to kill the threat, right? Nothing will eat my wife or my son. We're going to protect our families, protect our crops. We're going to protect our lives. We will get rid of the threat just like people do today. When you stand on God's word and equip yourself with a biblical worldview, we have answers to the questions of this age. We can defend our faith and we can boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, I think of these dinosaurs, we call them missionary lizards for two big reasons. First, when you properly understand dinosaurs, we reinforce a truth that our culture and the church so desperately needs to hear today. You can trust this book, all of it. It's right about the past, it's right about the present, it's right about the future. Why? Because it is God's word and it is right about salvation. Put your faith in Christ. And then the second reason I think of them as missionary lizards is because when we think of dinosaurs, we should think of death because they're dead. And why are they dead? According to the Bible, it would be because of sin. sin. The Bible says this, for the wages of sin is death. And the Bible also tells us this, that all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. And this is why every one of us, we all need a Savior. But that's why the good news is so good, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, the righteous for the ungodly. That if you will, Romans 10, 9, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. If you're a Christian here today, notice what I did. 
I went from dinosaurs to the gospel. I gave answers to get to the answer, Jesus Christ, because that's what apologetics is all about. It's about standing on God's word, defending the faith in order to declare the answer, Jesus Christ, to a lost and dying world.